Welcome to the retrospective of the Polish cult comedies from um, cult comedies from communist times. <laughs> um, my name is Anna Draniewicz and I am your host today and uh, for the next four days. I hope you'll be able to join us. Um, before I start talking about the films, a few organizational things I have to mention. First of all, uh, when the festival or retrospective uh, finishes, uh, we will send you an uh, email with a short survey and we will ask you to reply to a few questions. If you are watching more than one film with us, you might get the survey more than once, but you just have to do it once only and send it back to us. There will be a possibility there to tick which films you have seen. So you don't have to do it uh, you know, for each film separately, but just once for good. So that's one thing. The other thing is the license that we have for those films. It's only for the USA. So uh, if you are outside the USA and you are a Polish speaking person, you can easily access those films right now on YouTube or anywhere else online, just to refresh your memory because you probably know them. Um, and those links uh, will be working in the USA. The last thing I have to mention uh, is the fact that um, uh, I'm doing research about uh, Polish cult comedies, um, so I would like you to ask questions. That's very important for me that you ask questions. There are no stupid questions, there are only stupid answers. So whenever you see something in the film that you find uh, weird, you don't know what's happening, or you just you know, want to know more about what you, you just saw, then please go to the box at the bottom uh, of your screen, Q&A. If you cannot see it right now, just move your mouse and you should be able to see the Q&A part. Uh, you can also use it during the film. This film lasts one hour and 40 minutes, but we will give you a little bit more time, a few minutes more, uh, so you'll be able to stop uh, for a moment if, if there is something that surprised you and you want to ask a question. You can go back to Zoom, uh, put that question in the Q&A and then continue watching the film. Or if you miss one of the subtitles because they appear too fast, for example, you can go back a little bit and, and see it again. You'll be watching the films in a separate link that we will give you shortly uh, together with the password. Uh, but please do not close this Zoom um, window. Uh, just when you come back, the, the, the film, just come back here and we will start the Q&A sharply uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so that's for the questions that you have during the film. If after the film is finished, uh, you still uh, have a question that comes later, for example, and was not uh, answered during the Q&A, you can email me. Um, my email address will now appear in the chat, should be there now. Um, please copy it because it will disappear after we finish this event and close this window. You won't be able to see uh, anything in the chat anymore after that. So here is my email. Feel free to ask any questions about either the film or the subject of our retrospective. And the subject of our retrospective is, uh, can uh, humor be a tool of fight against a regime. And there are different um, views on that subject. Uh, humor studies, uh, academics, uh, some think that it is a tool of fight, others think that it's a peaceful form of protest or just merely a safety valve. But according to re the relief theory of humor, it can play a therapeutic and cathartic role. And Sigmund Freud believed that it allows people to express forbidden thoughts and therefore is a coping mechanism. So in Soviet bloc, the laughter was giving people the feeling of freedom, helped integrate and bond forming um, connections. So uh, we believe that thanks to that, they were able to um, feel that they are not alone, start to organize and fight the regime. So, uh, today's film uh, by Stanisław Bareja is already a third one that we're going to watch by this director. We watched two more last two days, and if you did uh, watch them with us, um, then you already uh, will know that I mentioned what I mentioned last time. Uh, the la first two films we watched were made together with a comedian called uh, Jacek Federowicz. He was playing the main character in yesterday's film. 
but after uh, these two films, they had uh, many more ideas together with the director, but they were all refused. Because in a communist Poland, to make a film, you had to first submit your script to the censors and to the film committee uh, of the film studio. And only if you were given the green light, you were able to start making the film. And even after the film was finished, you still had to show it back to them. And um, it was decided if the film will be released or not, it will, how many copies, and also very often the censors would tell you what you have to cut off. In case of this film, they actually uh, had to get rid of 10 minutes of the film, which was around 12%. So sometimes there will be um, scenes that will finish abruptly. Uh, and it's not because the director was not a good director. It's just that this film was cut uh, partially. Uh, back then, you had no choice. Uh, it actually went to the shelf. That was another thing. If uh, After the first... Um, meeting um, of the committee, they decided not to release it at all. It was made in 1977, but it was released finally only in 1979, so two years later. And the, the um, reason why it was released was that the Vice Minister of Culture and Art um, who was then ruling uh, and he was very, um, he was not very liked by the filmmakers because uh, yeah, he was not on their side. So his name was Janusz Wilhelmi, and um, he had an um, accident, uh, the plane that he was on crashed, and he died. And after that, this film was released because, you know, everybody changed. Uh, there were new people. They had watched it again. And after cutting 10 minutes off altogether, they decided to release it. Uh, but the, um, the way they were doing this kind of things, when they didn't like the film too much or what they were was showing what was shown in the film, they would not uh, advertise it uh, much. So this film had um, a very nice poster, but after it was decided at the beginning that it won't be released, the posters uh, were uh, destroyed. And then later a new one was made, but in a small amount of copies. Uh, there would be not many cinemas who would show it. And that was the way uh, to punish the directors uh, and to not you know, really release his film to the full potential. Um, this film was written uh, together, the, bar the director Barea wrote it together with Stanisław Tym. Uh, those who watched uh, yesterday's film with us uh, seen him in the role of Zenek. Uh, Zenek was the boyfriend of the second wife of the ex-husband of the wife of the protagonist. Yes, that's exactly who Zenek was. Uh, and uh, in this film, he actually plays double role because um, part of the film, very short um, part, was um, made in Paris. Uh, they were filming Gorilla Way, which means they didn't have any, um, they didn't ask for permissions they, because then you have to pay. So they would just go to Paris, few, a few people with camera, and just film, you know, whatever they could. So in this small uh, part uh, happening in Paris, Stanisław Tim is playing the driver of the car from the embassy. And then he's playing Dudawa, uh, the, the person who, who works with the protagonist, the main character, and who is his sidekick at, at work, and who, uh, excuse my French, suck up to him. Uh, we will talk about them more after the film. I just want to mention one more thing. Uh, the director, Stanisław Varea, also appears in these films and also in a double role. First time we see him in the scene in Paris, because only, you know, the main people from the film, director, scriptwriter, and, and the main car, um, actor went to Paris to make it cheap. The, the crew was very small. So they also had to pay, uh, play roles uh, during that one week of shooting in Paris. So the director appears in a scene when... Um, uh, the protagonist uh, with the driver and one more person from the embassy in, in France, in Paris, uh, go to, uh, um, we, we don't know exactly what's happening, but it looks like they're going to buy some calculators, which they call computers. Um, because when you bought them in Paris, you could sell them much uh, for much more uh, in Poland and then earn money this way. So they go to a, a Jewish seller who speaks Yiddish with his wife and Stanisław Vareja plays the wife. He appears in a balcony with a wig uh, 
says only one sentence, your pork chop is awaiting you. Um, and you will know when you hear that, that that's the director. He also appears second time later when there is a, mm, a, a car that normally should clean the streets, but stops at the taxi sign and, and works as a taxi. And Stanisław Barea, the director, he, he runs to that car, jumps in and says, take me to the uh, main uh, train station. That was a normal thing back then that people who would have a car or, or it was a work car they would use, uh, they would give rights to other people to earn some money on the side. So there was nothing uh, unusual about that. Um, and the one last thing I need to mention here before you start watching is that part of this film is happening in Hungary. The protagonist, the main character, goes to Hungary at the second part of the film and there will be times when people will be speaking Hungarian and that is not translated because we as viewers, as Polish viewers, didn't know what they're saying either. So don't be surprised uh, that there is no translation. If you hear people speaking but see no subtitles, that means they are speaking in a different language and we don't know what they're saying and it's not important, it's not part of the it's actually important to feel like the, the char character who doesn't know what they're saying either. Okay, I think that is the, um, everything that I had to mention before we start. So let me just um, copy the link right now. I will put it in chat again. And in a second, I will also add the password. So you have to click on that uh, link and put the following password in to be able to watch it. Okay. Yeah, uh, that should work. So we were giving you um, more than uh, one hour and 45 minutes. Please come back in exactly, yeah, one hour and 45 minutes. You will have time for a short break or to finish the film if, if, you know, if you have to stop it and you run over time a little bit. Um, okay, I hope you enjoyed the film and I will see you for the Q&A in one hour and 45 minutes. Thank you. Welcome back. Um, we should be all back by now. So hopefully you managed to finish watching the film. And I can see we have a few questions already. If you have any more, please write them down in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Before I start answering the questions, I would just like to talk a little bit about the film in general. This uh, film, unlike the other two by Barea that we watched the last two days, is making fun more um, of the propaganda of the success that was the official propaganda during uh, Gerek time in the late 70s. Uh, that was the time that many people until now um, remember as the best time in communism because um, we could buy more things, the shelves in the stores were not empty like in the 1980s. Uh, and that was because uh, Gerek, the party leader at the time, he would borrow money from the West. So that's how the Polish economy was working back then. So it was not real. And in this film, there is a great scene that portrays how it was all working. Uh, when the mm, main protagonist of the film asks uh, his co-worker, uh, his right hand, uh, how are we with the plan? He says, well, the plan is going very well. 95% is already you know, finished. And he says, but what's the, the, tell me the truth. This is the official uh, number, right? So he says, well, Okay, then 75% uh, is ready. And then he says, I said the truth. And that's why the, when the um, actor, uh, the, the um, character played by uh, Stanisław Tim says, well, the truth is nobody knows. Uh, so, and why did nobody know? Because as we can see in this film, nobody's working. Um, it's a very patchwork film, right? It's like um, you have to put all those pieces together, um, like in a puzzle. Um, so there is a lot of digressive uh, scenes uh, that are completely like separate episodes. Uh, we are in the middle of the main action and then suddenly we see somebody else who we don't know who that is. And then later we only see why because there is a reason for every person to appear on the screen. Everything is connected. 
all the things that happen are connected with each other. So um, this is how it's uh, made. It's very progressive way of making films, um, but you can get lost a little bit at first. It only falls back into place at the end, really. And some people uh, didn't like that and were saying that, you know, it shows that the director didn't have the right um, tools or knowledge how to make films. But we also have to remember that uh, part of that film was cut off. And many of the scenes that were cut off from this film, uh, Barea um, kept in his mind and later he reused all those ideas um, for uh, jokes or um, uh, any situations that he couldn't use here, uh, he used them in the um, TV series he made in the 80s for alternatives and uh, for drivers. Um, I can give you an example of one of such scene. Uh, for example, here in this film, um, the main protagonist uh, was supposed to be driving the car of his, uh, hmm, let's say, girlfriend in a way, uh, the girl who comes to him and says that she's pregnant with his child. Uh, so he's driving the, the car of her father, who is a minister uh, of some kind of sort. And it's a great car and he's driving very fast. And there is police or militia. Back then we didn't have police, we had militia everywhere, right? So they are um, on the side of the road. Um, and because he's speeding, normally they would stop him and give him a fine. But because they see a very nice expensive car, going fast, uh, the talk between them is, oh, that must be somebody important because when he saw us, he didn't slow down, he even speed up. So we shouldn't bother him, we shouldn't stop him uh, because we'll get in trouble. So that was the thinking. And that was the, um, uh, that this idea was later used in uh, the um, TV series Mimice called Drivers. Uh, but in that case, um, it was a taxi driver who was driving very fast because he was kidnapped um, and he had, uh, you know, uh, two men telling him that he cannot stop in front of the militia. So he started to speed up and it's the same situation. They say, oh, he probably could do it. So they don't chase him. Uh, they just let him go. So that's one of the examples. But there, there is man, many more. Um, that were this, this little episodic situations that um, were in that film, but had to be unfortunately cut off. So what we have is what's left after uh, the director um, cut off what was asked of him by the censors. He went back to the edit editing room and he tried to glue it back. So it makes sense more or less. And this is the film that we have. Maybe I should have warned you that it's a, like a patchwork and the film that we're watching tomorrow is similar. But the idea is that that gives the director and the scriptwriter uh, a possibility to show those little absurds of the society. So that we, yes, we do have a main story that glues everything together, but there is a lot of those little scenes happening in different places where we can see the society. And these are actually the, the parts that are more, most um, um, appreciated by Polish viewers and, and the ones that um, uh, the cult base of uh, Barea films uh, quotes because the best dialogues we have in those uh, scenes. So let's remember that this film is a cult film. Uh, all, practically all Barea films starting from the 70s uh, are, are cult films because they show the reality of communist times. Um, Krzysztof Pisiewicz, who was co-writer of Krzysztof Tyślowski films, uh, said about Barea films that they were um, like uh, uh, documentaries. They were uh, satires and they were obviously feature films, but they were just like, uh, like um, documentaries in a sense that now you watch it and you see exactly what the life looked like back then. He captured very well uh, what was happening in real life. And other directors, as he said, uh, like Vajda or Kieślowski or Zanussi, their films were more polished, right? They were um, very nice and, you know, artistic, but they didn't uh, capture the times uh, that well, because they were not showing uh, the real life. They were more 
uh, invented in a way, right? They were uh, really think, think, think through and the scripts were right, wrote down. So that's the difference. And that's why we love Barea's films um, up to now. And tomorrow we're gonna watch the ones that he's masterpiece. Everybody says that finally he got to a point when he got everything uh, right. Okay, so let's move on to the questions now. Let me have a look. Uh, please remember that you can still add some. So the first question we have here is, it appears women, women are objectified and not treated respectfully. Is this the culture at the time uh, or is it just for the movie? Uh, well, unfortunately, I must say that uh, uh, these films, as I just say, are, are mirrors of the society and they show very well uh, what the reality looked like. So I'm afraid uh, partially, yes, that was, uh, that was how women were, were treated. Now, obviously, uh, that's stereotyping a little bit because not all women and not, not all men <laughs> treated them that way. Uh, but uh, we could probably say that more than a half of, of men uh, would have such, um, let's say, not, not much respect towards women. And we see that in other Barea's film uh, very well. So women are mostly um, wives and um, mothers in those films. Uh, they do work sometimes. Um, but their work is not as important as the husband, right? If they are wives, then they should be cheated on. Uh, it's a little bit uh, maybe the, the uh, f French um, um, approach from the 60s that still linger in Poland in the 70s. Uh, you know, this idea that if you have a wife and then you have a lover, then it looks, looks good on you, right? Um, so women, on the other hand, um, it, it was very weird because they could work, obviously. Uh, it was even, um, they were even encouraged, especially in the very beginning of the 50s, to work at the same jobs as men. Uh, communism uh, was saying that men and women are equal and they have a right, you know, to, for education and, and work and, and everything. But at the same time, so though that was the... Um, official uh, propaganda and uh, ideas, which means theory, but in practice, what it really looked like uh, is more similar to, to that film. Um, that's probably caused by what I was talking about a little bit yesterday, which is the Catholic faith. Um, Poland is mostly Catholic, um, around 90%. That changes a little bit over decades, but more or less that. and uh, Catholicism brings specific mentality uh, with it. So, and also the history of Poland, uh, which was um, mm, the role of wom women in, in Polish history was very important as mothers. The, there was times when Poland uh, was not in existing, disappeared from the maps of Europe for over 100 years during the patricians. And uh, Polish people were, for example, forbidden to speak. Polish language, but the mothers at home would pass the language on, would pass the history on. Uh, so we always had the underground. For us, uh, having underground in communism was nothing new. We used to it, right? For every generation, practically, for many, many uh, centuries, uh, Polish people were fighting for their freedom. There's even a saying that every second generation of Polish people has to fight for the freedom of the country. So uh, there is this um, archetype of um, Matka Polka, as we say, which means Polish mother, who has to sacrifice herself for her children and who has to, she has to give everything to them. So she's not supposed to um, follow her um, you know, um, ideas, how she wants to live, but she has to uh, do what she has to do. Uh, so feminism, for example, uh, was uh, a swearing word. For some people, it still is the worst word you can use. You know, it's a bad word. Don't use it. Um, so even though, or maybe because the communism was saying that men and women are equal and Polish people saw communism as a Russian uh, thing that was imposed on them, they actually uh, rejected in a way. So feminism for them was something uh, foreign. 
And as I said, still some people still think of that uh, um, the same way now. Um, so they believe that Polish values are family, um, very traditional roles. Uh, so that was quite hard for women back then in communism because they very often had to um, put both together, be both housewives and mothers, and then work. Um, what that looked like in practice was very often they would work in offices and during office hours they would go out to do shopping for, for uh, the dinner in the evening. Because as we saw in these films, um, not many people work. They mostly, um, well, rest. The director, the main protagonist in one scene, he's asleep, right? When secretary, his secretary comes in, she has to wake him up. Uh, a woman in the post office or half post office, half bank, the place where you could get your money from. It was actually based in post offices, very complicated. Um, she's eating uh, strawberries while she works and one uh, patent, one person waiting in line gets uh, angry and says, uh, are you working or are you eating? So what she does is closing the window and eating, okay? Because she, why did she do it? Because she could. Uh, the um, work or attitude towards work was uh, a little bit like that. I mentioned it before, it didn't matter if you worked or not, you would still get your money. So what was the point of doing anything? And that's why nothing was working, nothing was produced uh, in an um, amount that was needed. And there was shortage of especially toilet paper. So here in this film, we have two rolls of toilet paper that are being used and, you know, that was really hard to get. So <laughs> that scene is funny for, for us. Uh, there was shortage of meat uh, or furniture. The, mm, the job, or the profession of the photographer, let's call him this way, the friend of the main protagonist who's hired to take pictures of his wife cheating on him. Uh, that man works uh, or earns money by staying in lines for other people. So people who work somewhere else and cannot wait in line for hours or for days and nights, uh, they would pay somebody. And he looks like it was jobless probably, uh, or maybe had a, like a part-time job and he was able to, uh, to work like that, just get paid by people to, to wait in lines. And um, the line he's waiting in this film is for furniture and he's counting like that, oh yeah, but by Wednesday those furniture should be here. So that means those people were waiting in line day and night. They would exchange maybe, you know, different people from the family would come, but to get furniture, they would have to wait a few days uh, and they were still not sure they would get it. So uh, yeah, that was the reality. Okay, but the question was about uh, women. Mm, unfortunately, I must say that yes, the, the general uh, opinion was that, you know, as long as women were young, uh, then they were chaste. <laughs> when they were getting older, would get become mothers and, and wives, then they will be treated uh, with less respect, unfortunately, I'm afraid, um, and they would be uh, mm, cheated on with the younger ones. Again, that's a, the generalizing, but uh, uh, yeah, we must say that uh, it was not um, very good. And the situation has changed after the change of the system. Uh, we started to have uh, gender studies and um, feminist organizations and even feminist uh, uh, manifestations every year. So uh, let's hope the mentality will change. I did mention before, and I say it again, unfortunately, the mentality of the society or a nation needs few generations to change. So because it was already changed by the communism and we have Homo Sovieticus now mentality, it's changing, but quite slowly. Okay, let's move on to the next question. What is the business with the naked man being chased through the pool? And yeah, that was the river and yeah, there is a man running away and then militia uh, following him. Well, this unfortunately is an example of one of the scenes that was much longer and some part of it was cut off. So it would make sense if we could see the rest of it. Uh, I read in one of the books that the censors decided to leave it because I, they thought, okay, well, he doesn't have to cut that part even though it's connected with what was there before. So without the, the beginning, we don't know 
what exactly is going on, but they thought it would be still funny because he would be running, so it would be like a slapstick comedy. So they, they didn't ask him to cut that off, but you know, it completely lost the whole meaning. So to be honest, the answer is I'm not sure. I cannot tell you because all the cutoff scenes disappeared. We don't know what was that. The director himself is dead. He died in 1987, so we cannot find out what was happening before, unfortunately. Uh, the next question, what is going on with the man holding up a sign and blocking the path of the photographer? This is about 36 minutes into the film. I know exactly which scene uh, you are mentioning here. Okay, so... Um, well, first of all, this scene kind of makes sense more a little bit later because, uh, again, this is one of these patchwork uh, episodes um, that uh, are used to show uh, the absurds of, of the reality uh, and of the, of the workers, Polish workers, not really working. So they are standing there thinking what to do with one of those slogans. The slogans are everywhere. Sometimes they were translated so you were able to see what's happening. That was the case in communist times. Wherever you would move, you would see those slogans, propaganda slogans. Uh, so here, wherever you go, you see advertisement uh, of products. Back in Poland, you would see advertisement of ideology. So all those slogans uh, were very often funny because, uh, well, everybody knew there were lies. This film actually is about the truth and the lies as well, again, because uh, it shows mm, like what you see and hear outside, you know that it's not true. You know that the truth is exactly opposite. So in this case, the slogan was um, something like, uh, the smile of uh, our child is an award for the teacher. And they were supposed to put it up between two uh, lamps above the street. That was their job, right? Uh, somebody told them to do it. Mm, probably, uh, let's say, I don't know, a society of teachers or some, somebody. Uh, and they were trying, mm, so they got the slogan ready and they were trying to measure uh, and to find two uh, lamps between which they could um, hang it. Unfortunately, it was too long. So somebody didn't uh, either measure before or it was supposed to be somewhere else. That was a normal case that nothing was thought through, everything was falling apart, you know, that was normal. So what they are trying to think of is, uh, and it's actually a very important scene because of that, they decide to cut off part of the slogan. And they say, well, a child is always somebody, so we don't have to say the smile of our child, let's just say the smile of a child is a, an award for a teacher. So they will cut part of that slogan out. Now, that's exactly what the censorship was doing with that film, right? So it's actually, it's like a symbolic scene of the censorship in, in, in films uh, back then. And I think uh, Barea put it there because of that uh, connotation. So uh, later, this is not the end though, right? So I think you wrote that question, I can see by the time you wrote it, that uh, it was right after we saw the, them for the first time. They, they decide to cut it off. Uh, our photographer passes them and it's just like, a, they, they will clash, right? We always see somebody that we follow the story and then they meet those other people that are episodic and we will just see what they're doing. So that's, that's like an introduction. But they are actually very important uh, later because um, there, there are two more scenes uh, with them. The second one is um, when two um, vans with uh, sand that go out of the, um, of the factory, they transport the sand out, uh, are stopped and um, um, uh, one gentleman is checking if they're not stealing. That was a normal thing that everybody would steal from everywhere, especially construction sites, right? So they are taking sand out, but they, this man is checking if they are not stealing uh, bricks. Uh, and then we have this another episode, very short episode, just showing, you know, regular life, showing even, showing something else that we will mention at the end when we will talk about the subject, what exactly, how is the society portrayed in this film. So they have a kind of fight, uh, right? And later they are chasing each other. Uh, they want to fight and they are chasing each other and they hit 
one of the legs, which makes it bend. And now the slogan is too long. Uh, so they have to um, sew it back in the our child uh, part. Um, and in those, it's also the swing when we have a joke. It's just, you know, reasons for, for jokes, for anecdotes, um, all those little side scenes. So in this scene is two older men looking at those two cars chasing, saying, wow, they are working really fast, you know, thinking that they are in a hurry for work, right? Because they want to bring the sand to the next construction site to build a new building. But what really happens, and we know it because we've seen the scene before, is that they are just, just fighting with each other and they just chase each other because they are mad. So one, one is mad at the other, wants to, wants to get him and probably beat him up. So that's the second time we see um, the same um, man with the, with the sign. The third one is when they are sitting on the side of that road between the, next to the lamps and the one who proposed or suggested to cut off the part our child now is suing it back in. And that's when our photographer comes back to them and because he saw them on the way uh, to the house of the director, the protagonist, right, and his wife. So he remembered uh, that they were there and when he needed to get into the window to take pictures of the director's wife cheating on him, or as he thought, because later we find out it was their maid, not their wife. So he goes to them and he says, well, I have a business, you know. He obviously bribes them, that's for sure. I mean, we don't see that in the film, but we know. He gives pays them money to um, put him on that um, crane, I guess and to elevate him up to the window so he can take those pictures. So that's that scene. I hope I explained it well. And uh, let's move to the next one. What does order reigns in Warsaw means? Okay, this one will be a little bit longer. I'll try to make it uh, short and not too complicated. Okay, it won't be very easy. So uh, um, it was a sentence said by a foreign minister of affairs of France in uh, 1831. So right after the November uprising, uh, Polish uprising against the Russia empire uh, was finished. The Russians crushed uh, Polish um, soldiers. Uh, and uh, Lord Rein à Varsovie, was a sentence uh, used by this foreign affairs uh, minister uh, in Paris who said uh, that the yeah, order is back in Warsaw. It's, it's like a saying, I'm explaining where it comes from, but the meaning of it really is, uh, mm, it's ironic, okay? Because whenever somebody would say later in Poland, order uh, reigns in, in Warsaw or it's back, Warsaw is back to order, which meant that the fights are finished, but uh, for us, it was not order, right? We were fighting for independence. The Russians crushed uh, the um, um, uprising, but the French uh, could be, they were relieved because, okay, they're not fighting anymore. It's back to normal, Russians took over. So for them, it was normal that they took over and there are no problems in Europe, right? It's all calm, it's all fine. Obviously for Polish people, it was not fine because they were fighting for uh, independence and they wanted a different outcome. So this saying uh, is used when you want to say that, uh, uh, ironically, let's say, um, that other, other countries don't care about us um, most, mostly. Here it's used by the photographer. So first time, first of all, it's uh, used as a joke a little bit, right? Because he talks to his uh, daughter and he's using it, but then he adds the sentence almost. So there's almost peace and, and everything. So because it means like everything is fine in Warsaw, everything is back to normal, right? But he says, yeah, well, almost is, everything is back to normal. It's not really back to normal until we get rid of the Russians again. The situation is uh, repeating, the history is repeating itself, right? And that, that uh, mentality of Polish people that other countries don't really care about us is ongoing. And uh, the best example and the um, freshest memory in those times, the 70s, was from the end of the Second World War, 1945, and the Yalta Conference. Uh, everybody in Poland was talking about it uh, between themselves. It was not the official uh, thing you could say. 
but everybody knew that the big uh, three, which was uh, Stalin, Churchill and Roosevelt, they met in Yalta and they divided uh, Europe and they gave up Poland uh, to, to, to Russia. There's a lot of history here. I don't want to go there um, really because it's going to last forever. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yes, yeah, so it was, uh, it's a saying. Uh, it's a bitter uh, saying of Polish people, uh, meaning like, yeah, everything is fine, uh, everybody is happy, except for us, because we've been sold out again. Uh, but it was used uh, as a joke. And it's obviously a thing that the photographer says, he likes to use it, it's like his, his thing, it's something he would repeat uh, a lot, I guess. He's an educated person, that's for sure. Uh, the funny scene with him as well is about Otello. Otello is the play that um, our main uh, protagonist watches in Hungary. He doesn't understand what's going on much, but he realized that this guy is killing his wife. And he says, well, that's perfect. I, why, why do I bother with the divorce, right? He gets drunk and he says, yeah, I could just get somebody to kill her. Uh, but in the next scene, we have the photographer talking to somebody in the line, waiting line, about Otello. And he says, uh, do you know what, have you seen Otello? And the guy uh, says, where? And he says, oh, then you haven't seen him. And he says, how do you know? Well, he knows because Otello is not a person. Well, it is a person, but it's a play. So when he says where, that proves that he doesn't know what Otello is. Um, and, you know, he, he is not aware that, it, that it's a play. Looks like the, our main uh, character didn't know uh, that it's not a Hungarian play because he does say that sentence that you Hungarians you write very good plays that's a very good idea to just kill your wife instead of divorcing her so yeah so it's all just all those things are used uh, for those little jokes and there's a lot of these little jokes and some of them might be harder to uh, to pick up uh, and might need some little bit of knowledge uh, so yeah, that's why I'm here to answer all the questions like that. Uh, I hope I answered this one and explained well. If you have any others like that, they are welcome here. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Who was Danusia that she could get away with running a guy over with the car? And uh, I think I already answered that question earlier on, saying that Danusia was the daughter of a minister. Now, how do we know that? Because when he, the protagonist takes her to the doctor, his friend, uh, he doesn't realize who she is. Well, well, he picks her up in the embassy in France. He doesn't know who she is either. He has no idea, right? Uh, they just exchange first name, Danusha. That's it. That's all he knew about her. Now, the, the doctor uh, obviously is looking at her ID. Maybe he's writing some kind of prescription for her or filling in the health card. Uh, whatever it is, he needs her name, right? So he is the one who sees the last name and realizes that it's the last name of one of the ministers, or maybe even the, the party leader. We don't know who. We know she's a daughter of somebody very, very important. That's all we know. We don't need to know who that is, right? Even that, that gives you a chance to decide yourself who you think that is. Uh, but the doctor realizes who she is, goes back to our protagonist and tells him, do you know what her last name is? And he says, well, it's a common last name, right? But then in the ID, you also had mm, the names of the parents. In. So when he finally opens the, her ID and looks in, and then also has two flashbacks, one to, one to the embassy, uh, when this gentleman is standing on the stairs who showed him Paris around, tells him, no, don't, don't, I wouldn't recommend, you know, going and chatting to her. That was one. And the second one is exactly when they had the accident. And she's explaining to the militia men that yes, it was their fault, but you know, she's in a hurry and she wants to go. The militia probably checked her ID, like everybody, like they always do. You always had to have your ID with you, and they would always check it. Uh, and then he realized who she is and let them go. So that explains who, who she was. Not, not exactly, because we don't know exactly who she was, but yeah, she was somebody very, very important, uh, or a daughter of somebody very important. Okay, let's have a look at the next one. The scene with the TV show, especially the one where the two surgical teams were competing, seemed very strange. Was that representative of Polish TV during this time? Uh, yes, uh, that scene again, uh, it's something that seems like completely out of the blue, 
but what we realize later that the, the wife of the protagonist is in the um, jury. Uh, uh, she's, a, she's, a, she's a journalist, looks like that's her, her work, uh, right? So um, it looks like she doesn't have much to do, right? She just walks around the, the city. What we find out about her during that one day when the photographer is um, following her is the, that she's not the nicest person uh, either. Because uh, in that scene of the TV show, her friend, the blonde woman who comes to her during the break to chat to her about um, um, a coat she heard uh, about and she wants to buy. So unfortunately for her, she gives the, the wife of the protagonist too much details. And she's asking to, for some money. She wants to borrow some money to be able to buy that, buy that, that coat. Uh, so the wife uh, uh, says, yes, of course, I'll help you come tonight to my place. I'll give you the money. And what she does is going to that place, finding out first. That's why she goes to the um, grocery store, because the information that she has is that the, the director or manager of the grocery store knows who is uh, the, the Turkish person selling the coat. It's a Turkish coat, right? So uh, she's actually uh, cheating uh, her friend right because she goes there and she buys it uh, beforehand and that that um, whole um, idea of her buying the coat uh, not only shows us that she's not uh, a very good friend but also gives us a chance to show all these other little scenes in the post office uh, in the hotel um, in the in the shop uh, with the line and two men fighting uh, in the line and these are all full of jokes and and funny dialogues uh, that just give to the flavor um, of the film um, so yeah let's go back to the tv show uh, yes in a way this tv show makes fun of a lot of things now it's a little bit exaggerated yes we did not have a, a competition between two surgical teams for sure ever right but uh, we we know that it's so absurd that it could happen in a way. So we know it's exaggeration, but that's why it's funny as well. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of funny moments in that short episode of the TV show. The second one is when one of the contestants uh, replied to a question that she hasn't been given yet, right? The answer is about, uh, the question is about the, um, the number of the beds and she replies about the number of hours that volunteers work for. So uh, the, the poor guy who's the host of the TV uh, show, he's saying, oh, well, this is the next question, but I hope the jury will, uh, you know, uh, will give you the point for this answer. And again, that's exaggerated. That probably wouldn't happen, but that's supposed to show that we know everything on TV is fake. Everything was propaganda. Everything was made, prepared, pretending to be live and happening now but we knew it was not. The third example of that is a poor old lady who is called by her name and uh, the, the TV host is saying, what would you like to hear, madam? And she's reading from a piece of paper in a very unnatural way that she would really like to hear this song by this guy. And then the guy shows up and he sings, right? So again, it was all staged. And we know that in reality, in, in Poland, uh, in party meetings, you would very often have uh, the questions distributed ahead. You were not allowed to ask the question that was not prepared and you could only you know, read the one that you were given. Uh, so we knew all of these things were real, but these scenes were exaggerated just to make uh, fun of that, but also to make fun of the system in that way and uh, all the lies and propaganda that was all around us. Uh, so that's uh, this one. There is also a comment, uh, another too clever by half protagonist. Uh, I guess you are talking about this poor director. Now, poor, he's obviously not a good and nice person. He's a bad person. Uh, he cheats on his wife. Uh, when he realizes that the, the woman he's, uh, that's pregnant with him is a daughter of somebody very important, he decides to divorce his wife and marry her, especially that we know he's gonna lose his job any minute. Now, and we hear about the director who was there before him, who lost his job uh, not long ago, right? And that was what was happening. 
those people would be fired because the plan was not uh, finished on time. The plan could not be finished on time. They had nothing to do with that. Uh, they would be transformed to another um, company, completely different. They, you know, they, it was not about the skills they had. Uh, as we know from the men, woman, um, wanted men, woman, the film that we watched two days ago, uh, those people were just, their profession was to be di directors. So they would be directors from one factory to another, just moved from one place to another, usually promoted. Um, so again, it's just completely surreal, but true. Uh, they didn't know what they're doing. They really have no impact on what was happening because nobody did. It was all a big mess, to be honest. Uh, so uh, he is, uh, in a way, um, poor in the sense that in the end, he's losing it all. He lost his job that was taken over by the, uh, his sidekick, the coworker that was sucking up to him before all the time. Uh, who is obviously less intelligent and less skilled than him even, uh, but he's clever enough to, to uh, well, marry the woman uh, who's pregnant with the director before him. He actually is the one who sends him to Hungary, and that's where everything falls apart, right, for, for the director. So the wife finds out that he asks uh, his friend, the photographer, to follow her, and she decides to divorce him. Uh, and the, the young girl in the meantime, uh, the daughter of the minister or somebody important, uh, marries the other guy. And that's why he becomes the, the new director, uh, because, you know, of nepotism that was uh, in, in Poland back then. So uh, the ending is uh, bitter in a way, but on the other hand, we know he deserves it. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, he asked for it uh, in a way, right? So we don't really feel uh, sorry for him. The only problem is that usually when this change was happening, the next person who would get the job, like in this case, would be probably even worse. But uh, surely a very, mm, uh, you know, a party member and uh, uh, very uh, involved uh, in communist ideology. So um, the problem with, the, not the problem, but the, the thing about this film is that um, when we look at it in the end, we see that everybody in these films is not really likable. It's really hard. If you can think of somebody that you liked in that film, please tell me so in the comments. But I think it will be quite hard. We see that all these people are, um, well, they are homo sovieticus. They do the wheeling and dealing. They do the cheating. They do anything it takes uh, to survive. Uh, or in the case of the director, it's more than just survive. It's to stay on the top. And we see how he abuses the power all the time. Uh, the poor guy on the bike, he was the best biker uh, practicing probably before the next uh, Olympics. Uh, but this guy needs a car. He calls his friend, the director of another company, and he says, I need the bike. They take the bike away. Next thing, it's the motorcycle, right? Because the taxi driver couldn't stand driving behind this poor woman, the wife of the director, who couldn't obviously drive. She was so-called Sunday driver, uh, as we could see when she started to... Uh, start the car, she goes backwards first instead of forward, then she's going very slow and then she's using her, uh, she, she's showing that she's going to turn right all the, all, the, all the time. She never turns, but you know, uh, that's what she's indicating. So uh, the wife is not perfect. You could say maybe the photographer, but unfortunately the photographer uh, ends up in bed with the wife, cheats on his wife, he, and we know he has two daughters. In the end, he's thinking, what am I supposed to do? I love this woman now. He is a positive person for, for a long time in this film. He seems like it, like he's a little bit above all that. But in the end, uh, you know, he, he makes a mistake as well. He shouldn't obviously have cheated on his, on his wife. So nobody really here is very likable. Uh, they all have uh, some negative uh, sides. And that brings me to the, to the ending. And uh, nobody asked about the pig. What is the pig symbolizing at the end of this film? 
Well, uh, obviously, there are actually two things connected with that. One is that um, it was symbolizing the fact that the society changed into pigs. So that everybody uh, is not human. So what communism ideology was supposed to do was changing people in the superhumans, better people, but what in reality was doing was changing in them into worse versions of themselves. So that's the symbolic ending uh, with the pig. Another thing is she runs away from the factory when she's gonna be killed. And that uh, actually is um, uh, a symbol of the lack of meat. There was shortage of meat uh, in, in communist Poland. And the interesting thing is that the director, uh, Stanisław Barea, he was from the family of butchers. Both his father and his grandfather before the war uh, were making uh, uh, cold meat uh, and were selling them and they were like masters of the art, which means they were making very, very good uh, ham or, you know, salami or, or things like that. But in communist times, meat was uh, uh, a luxury. Now, we see a lot of it at the very beginning, at the banquet, right? At the, when, when the director is giving a speech and all the journalists don't listen to him because they know he's going to probably be um, losing the job, but what they are waiting for is the food. So we see there a lot of it because the party members, they had everything, right? They, they had no problems getting anything. It was the common, normal people. Uh, the photographer is representing uh, one of them. Uh, they were the ones who would not be able to get all the things that they really need, the most important ones. But uh, here, this film shows that, as I mentioned, that even those parts of the society were also um, infected by this disease. Uh, and, you know, and, and uh, both those things uh, are connected with this pig, which is, which is also meat. Now, that uh, idea of shortage of meat will come back tomorrow. Uh, we will watch the last film by Barea, the last feature film he made. After that, he only made two more TV series, very popular, by the way. Uh, and then, yeah, we will be able to see even more. Because for Barea, the lack of meat was kind of a personal thing because of his uh, family history, I, I guess. So, yeah, let me sum it up. Uh, uh, I hope I answered all, all, all of your questions. Uh, I hope it gives you uh, also some um, in, um, better view of what was happening in that film. Uh, tomorrow's film will also be a patchwork a little bit. Again, we will have a main story and then we will have some um, episodes on the side. But the, as I say, they kind of all come together in the end. If you if you just keep on watching, get to the end, then you should you know you should understand what's what's happening. Uh, after that, we have one uh, rom com coming, and then two uh, films by Juliusz Machulski, the king of Polish comedy, who almost made it to Hollywood. His Sex Mission was supposed to be remade, but even though the rights were bought, it was never uh, the remake never never happened. But um, those the last two films are uh, something that you might be more used to. Uh, more American. He was actually trying to make like American comedy. So I do recommend all, all of them. I hope to see you tomorrow and the rest of the week. <laughs>